Thank you. Let me, let me open this time up with a, a slogan that I use, and I want you to know that right now, in this part of my life, I feel um, um, absolutely fulfilled in the sense that I feel that I'm struggling to do right now, in this time of my life, exactly what I have sort of always wanted to do for the Lord and what I, I feel like that I'm doing it right now in my life. And that's a sort of a release and a good feeling that I have. And I'm really delighted to be here. But one of the things that I, and I'm speaking to groups all over the country, and I'm speaking in, uh, to large groups, uh, uh, governor's prayer breakfast, mayor's prayer breakfast, business executives, and other folks are putting this on, and I'm getting the privilege of just going there, speaking at the largest congregation uh, in, a, in, in, in the country, uh, uh, the, in fact, the largest church in the United States. I'll be speaking there for a few days in just a few weeks. And I'm doing this all the time. So I'm doing exactly what I feel that God saved a third grade dropout to do. I feel like I'm doing now exactly what God called me to do. Amen. One of the things that I say when I go out and speak at these uh, congregation, I will say that uh, some people, you know, we are, we are at the threshold of a renewal in this country. Uh, we at this threshold of us realizing that we need a renewal all the way through. We at the threshold of that. And, uh, and, and, uh, and when I go out and, and so some, some people it, it is always trying to go back to some day when the country was okay. <laughs> you, you, you know, and they'll say things like, let's go back to the religion of our founding fathers. And I said, I don't want to go back there. I'd be a slave. I said, why don't we go back to the Bible? Why don't we go back to the Bible and let's try to understand what Jesus meant when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what we want to do and what we want Christian community development to be, we want to be people that is out of the word of God we are people who are connected and we recognize that we was created in Christ Jesus unto good works we're not just doing these good works even because there's social problem we're doing these good works because God has called us to do good works let your light so shine before the world that they might see our good works and glorify the father which is in heaven and this is not works in order to get to heaven this is not works for salvation this is work in obedience to what Jesus has called us to and so we want to go back and we want to learn how to do it that's the purpose of the Bible the Bible says uh, the scripture is given so that the men people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works it is more than just worshiping God, and that's important. We need to admire him. We need to worship him. And I like that new slogan that we picked up this year. We always pick up that someday we're going to be able to kiss the neck of Jesus. Isn't that going to be wonderful? And that we can worship him now. And that we can worship him. And he calls us to worship him. And he calls us to similar ourselves together to worship him. But that's not the end. Jesus called us to be his workmanship to do his will and we ought to consider ourselves really thrilled and honored that we can actually do the will of God that we can participate in doing the will of God and so we want that will of God though to be anchored in the Word of God we want to be working in obedience to what God has said and what God has called us to do and to be and so open your Bible this morning to the book of Genesis the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 27. You should bring your Bibles. This is a Bible study. <laughs> this, is, this is not an exercise this morning in preaching. This, we're here this morning to study the Bible. Okay. Genesis. 37. Let me read it and then I'll tell you what I'm going to do here this morning. Genesis chapter 37 beginning at verse 1. 
Genesis chapter 37. Why you find it? Then let me give you the backup for it. What we going to do here this morning? Uh, from the time CCDA closes every year, Gordon and I start the process of getting ready for the next convention time together. We started talking about it. We have a retreat together. We do the evaluation that you give us and we, we hear that. One of the things we hear that the first night of the convention should not go after t oh, 10 o'clock. And last night we were doing all we could to get you out by 9.30. We, we missed it, but that's one of the evaluations. So we go over the evaluation and then we look and, we, and I start then to, to planning my talks that I'm going to do for the next year. And I start to plan in those talks in relationship to the need that we see and we hear and what's going on in the society. And so then I began my study and I began to prepare my talks for the coming year. What we did this year, we thought that we would talk about integrity, vulnerability, and brokenness. And so then I arranged my talks so that I could deal with each one of those subjects. And then what I want to do then is go to the Word of God, look into the Word of God, find the precedence in the Word of God, and then uh, find then the character. You see, the characters in the Bible, some of those are, uh, they are shadows of Jesus. Jesus is, is, our, is God, and he's the one that we are patting our life after. We're the one, he's the one that we're following. But he also calls people and makes those people role models, and he projects them up that we can look at them, and we can take the virtues out of their lives and apply them to our lives, and then we can be more like Jesus. And so I began to look at the image, the model, who would be the role model we would lift out of the scripture. And then we looked at it and, we, and I said, ah, for integrity, for integrity, I said, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. And so this morning, as we study, and you can go on back home and study even after this, uh, the life of Joseph. Now, this is the one person in the scripture, there are, well, there's two in scripture, that you can find absolutely no blemish in their life. Not one. And that's Joseph and Daniel. Are two in the scripture that there is no blemish. You know, David, the great king, the one who Jesus is going to sit on his throne when he comes to reign and to rule, David was the great king. Never a king like David. Never will be another king like David. Although Jesus will sit on David's throne, he is now the king of kings. But David was the greatest human king. But we don't know that David had blemishes, don't we? Right. But here we have a character we're going to look at this morning. As far as humanly possible, we can't see any blemish. I know he was a sinner just like you and me, and I'm sure he made mistakes like you and me, but God wanted to project him as one that we could emulate in life. Amen. That if we wanted to have integrity, we could look at a person of integrity, and then we could shape our life after that person. And so this morning, we're going to look at the life of, of, our, of our Joseph as we look at integrity. Tomorrow morning... Uh, we're going to look then at the guy who is vulnerable. Who is the guy vulnerable? And we need to be vulnerable. We need to expose ourselves. We need to take risks for God. We don't need to be conservative in everything. We need to be conservative in our theology. We need to be liberal in our opportunities. And we need to make risks and take a chance in life. And that was this great man. When I think of him, he almost brings tears to my eyes. And that's Elijah. We're going to look at one who was willing to confront the society and turn the society around and Elijah turned the people back to God. Single-handed, he turned the people back to God. And so we're going to look at him as one was vulnerable. We're going to see him running. We're going to see him in cave. We're going to see him as a person just like us with all of the anxieties we have. But we're going to see one who stood up and turned the nation back to God. And then on the next morning, we're going to look at brokenness. 
And that morning, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul. God broke that bigot on that Damascus road. God broke him on that Damascus road, and he broke him with his love. He embraced him with his love, and he broke him with love. And the apostle could never get over the fact that God laid hold of him under the master's robe, and he could say in Philippians that I may lay hold of him the way he laid hold of me. And so we're going to look at that. And so that's going to be our lesson that we're going to look at as we go. Now this morning, we want to go and look at this person of integrity, of integrity. Now, we're talking about leadership for today. Uh, God is a leadership God. God is not a consensus God. God don't go around and get consensus. God don't take polls. God, God don't see what people, th care what people think. God is a leadership God. And, and God don't usually, now, we are here this morning, but God don't usually himself, God don't usually speak to groups. God speaks to individuals. And he nurtures those individuals. Then he gives those individuals vision. And then those individuals are to share the vision with the other people. People are always like sheep without shepherd. And people always need a shepherd. And so God speaks in the ears of leaders and gives them a vision. And they walk in humility and then share that vision with others. And people are chained and violent. And so we're going to look at that uh, this morning, the kind of leaders we need. And so we need leaders with vision. We need leaders with big vision, big vision. We're going to see this morning what made Jake, Joker, Joseph such a great man. Is that from the time he was a little boy, he had this vision for his life. He had this vision for a nation. He had this vision to save the whole world. And so you need a vision. And the Bible says without a vision, the people perish. And so we need leaders today with a vision, with a vision. You know, I meet some, meet some people, and, 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 and time you try to say something about the future, they start telling you about all the problems that's related to it, and just sort of kill your spirit. You know, intelligent is to solve problems. And I make an assumption out there that there's problems. And so I want people to gather around me with the intelligent, and let's take on the problem. Send us the problem, and let's solve it. Don't tell me about the problem. Let's solve the problem. And so we're going to see, we're going to see this morning that this guy had nothing but problem. Nothing but problem. But those problems is what's going to make him strong. Right. It's going to be in the midst of those problems that he's going to be able to interpret vision. And it's through the problem of life that we grow. Pain, pain and suffering is not a negative. Suffering in the Bible is a virtue. People think more creatively in pain. And so we need to uh, take on pain. Take on pain. It is in suffering we get redemption. It is in suffering and pain is redemption in life. And so let's look then at leaders. Just for a few minutes then, let's look for a minute. Let's look at what are the ingredients, the basic ingredients in going to leadership? What are the three most important elements in leadership? Uh, assuming that you've got to have vision. That's a given. Vision is a, is a given. Without a vision, the people perish. And so the leader is a person who explains vision and shares the vision that came from God. Now we take that for granted. But what are the three most important important ingredient as we try to implement that vision in life. There's three. Energy, intelligence, and character. Energy, intelligence, and character. All problems are solved. All problems are solved by energy management. Energy management. You put energy in. The best energy is human energy. Mm -hmm. Because intelligence is a part of human energy, or ought to be a part of human energy. So the first one is energy. The second one is, in, is intelligent. And the third one is character. Energy is the ability and the emotion to act. 
Any great leader has a great amount of enthusiasm, has a great amount of energy. And so leaders learn how to manage their own energy and direct their energy toward the problem that they are seeking to solve. First one is energy. The second one is intelligence. Intelligence. That's it. You know, today, the people of the church with the energy, and I praise God for that church, and I praise God that God has brought the Holy Spirit and he has used that church, the charismatic church. He has used it to, to show us the Holy Spirit and we can see the Holy Spirit at work within the charismatic church. The weakness of that though, they haven't wrapped enough intelligence around it. <laughs> They're acting more out of emotion instead of wrapping some intelligence around that emotion. And so God wants us to be people of intelligence because he is the source of wisdom. A wisdom. So we need the Holy Spirit in the church. We need the charismatic church. We need the Pentecostal church. We, the wonderful spirit is there. But we now have got to bring intelligence around that. And so it can be guided by intelligence, so it can be effective in the neighborhood and in the community. And the third one, of course, is, is character. Character is that which reproduces itself. Character is that which people see in you. Character is when uh, the bulls uh, are losing by 10 points and they bring Michael Jordan on. And his very behavior depicts character. We saw it again this year in baseball, and thank God for that. We saw it in Big Mac, but we also saw it in Sosa. I liked it when he would say to Big Mac, you are the man. And I liked it when Big Mac would say, you are the man. And while they was encouraging each other, we saw again character, character and integrity. That's what we want to get to here this morning. We want to look at it. This is what God needs, and we got the background to paint it over. All of us know that our whole nation have a character deficiency. We know that in our society. We know all the whole world. Uh, even Borweski, Yeski, uh, he can't stay sober. You, you know, while our president can't keep his pants up, uh, he, this guy can't stay sober. So the greatest leaders in the world got character deficiencies. And so this is a great time. This is a great time for us as the people of God to display that character. Now the idea of, the idea of discipleship was to shape our character. I don't know what y'all thought discipleship was all about. I hear all of this stuff today about I'm in some kind of discipleship group and people are living like clowns. <laughs> the idea of discipleship is to shape our character so that our lives, just by living them, can be impactful in the lives of others. We need to be able to say to others, follow me as I follow Christ. You ought to always be telling them about where you came from, you should always be telling them about the, the deficiencies in your life that you're trying to collect, correct, but say to people after that, man, I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with trying to be what God has called me to be. I'm a disciple. Jesus says, follow me, and I will shape your character. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men and women. And so that's what discipleship is all about. So now let's go then and look at our leader this morning that we want to model out uh, for, our, for the time we have here. Let's look and let's meet our person this morning, our leader. We understand where we're going now. We understand leadership. We understand we're looking now, we're finna look now for integrity in this person. And let's look at a little bit how this integrity came in his own life and what's important in a person's life for this integrity to grow and to develop. Look what it says now. It says now in verse 1, it says, And Jacob, and y'all know who Jacob was. He was the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of, of uh, Abraham. And Abraham was the Assyrian that God called out of Assyria and made a Hebrew to become the father of a nation. Y'all understand that. God made him a nation. And he took an Assyrian and made him that Hebrew, you understand that. And so, and then he called this man Jacob, 
you know, he made him the, 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 the son that would produce the 12 sons. Really, he produced 12, but actually we're going to see that Jacob, Joseph here is going to have two of the tribes because of his commitment to God and because of his love for God. God then gives him Jacob. Joseph's name is the name of two tribes. Why Joseph himself don't have a tribe. What we have there is uh, in there, I think it's uh, Manasseh and Benjamin. They become the tribes. Those are the sons of Joseph in the Bible. So you got that. That's a little historical background to what we are getting in, what we're getting in at here. So Jacob dwell in the land where his father was a stranger in that land. Now let, look here. This is, I'm going to say this right quickly. That God calls us to always be a pilgrimage people. We are not to adjust ourselves to this world. We have to be a pilgrimage people. We have to be more than Democrats and Republicans and communists and liberals. We have to be God's witnessing force in the world. We are called to be pilgrims. And if you so overcommit yourself to any one of those world ideologies, you have conform to the world and you can't be the kind of witness that God wants us to be in society. And so don't come to me tell them, okay, I want everybody to vote. I want everybody to, be a, to participate in the political process. But don't overtie yourself to one of these political parties thinking that, that black folks have done that and they can't even condemn Clinton and his stuff. I mean, that's one group of people black Clinton not have. Is all these black folks that gathered around him and they say, say nothing to me. Well, he has been a fairly good administrative president. But I want you to know that his moral character is not that that you want your grandchildren to eliminate, to, 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 to imitate in life. And so that we all, we as Christians, while we need to talk about the good that's in people, we also need to talk about those deficiencies in their life. And that we shouldn't be so engrafted into the Democratic Party that we can't hold that party accountable. And that's where our black leadership is at. And it ain't no sense in us talking about. I'm telling you, I, I have always been somewhat, I would never really too easily to condemn uh, Clarence Thomas. But I want you to know that it is a scam. It is a scam that he don't have but one or two black clerks and he got that position to represent black people. That's, right. That's a scam. And to say you can't find yeah. uh, eight or ten black lawyers who could write those briefs for him is a scam. What he's done, he overbought into conservatism. Yeah, I want you to understand that. Just like most of our other blacks have overbought into the Democratic Party. Yeah. And so don't get too overbought in those. We are pilgrimage. We are pilgrim people. We, we live in a land and we witness by the way we live to the nations around us. And that's what Jacob was here. Jacob was a pilgrim in the land. He was a pilgrim. And we're going to find that Joseph is going to be a pilgrim in the land. And wherever he goes out as a pilgrim, he's going to be able to witness to the glory of God. He's not going to oversell himself out to the system that he can't be a witness to the glory of God. And so we as people, CCDA, yes, I know a lot of us are going to be getting government grants now. They're making all that possible for us. Don't say yourself out to this system. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we look for the Savior. Amen. Let's use this system. Let's use the system, but let's don't sell our soul to this system. And this is Jacob. Let's continue here with Jacob. It says here, and he said, these are the generation. It's important that you see that, that Jacob dwelled in the land where his fathers was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generation of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old when he began to become this great, great leader. So God uses young people. 
Now, something had already went into Jacob's life, Joseph's life, before he's 17. Look what it says here about here, 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 about Jacob. It says that um, Jacob, being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks of his, of his brother, brethren, and the lad was with the sons of his uh, Beliah and the sons of Zippah. That's, uh, those are the maids that, that, that gave birth for uh, Rebecca, was it? For, 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 um, for, for, for Jacob. Now, for Rachel, excuse me, for Rachel. Those are the children who made birth for her. Now, look what it says here. And Joseph brought his brought unto his father their evil report. Even from a little boy, this guy had a good vision of what's right and wrong. And he told his father how his brothers behaved in the world. So he had been raised by his father and by his mother, and that's so important. The father's import in shaping character is unmeasurable. I want you to understand that. I go to prison, and as I go to prison, I discover that 80% of the kids who are in prison grow up without a father in their home. Most of the criminologists and sociologists understand that one of the greatest problems we have in our society today is the fact that the family is so fragile. That's why the church needs to be so strong in terms of shaping families. I heard it last night when this brother said, boy, it thrilled my heart when he said 30% of our congregation are men. Yes. In particular, when we said 30% of our, our congregation are black men. And I want you to know that we have some strong black men in the black community. You're going to see two of those this morning as I finish here today. And so let's look then at this guy. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other children. It is so important that a child have the love of his father. That's the strength. That's the strength. That's the dynamics. I raised eight children, and I listened to my eight children. I listened to them. Now, I cannot undermine Vera May's love. For the, the children love Vera May more than they love me. I, for these 40 some years since we've been married, I've always tried to get the children to love me more. <laughs> I, I, I meet with them, and I meet with them all the time, and we conspire. We get together and we carry on conversations about mama. You, 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 you know, and I do all the kind of conspiring I can to get them to love me more, but they love her the most. <laughs> and so the mother's love is there to give to the children the straight certain of love. Mother's love is deep. But in order for the character to be shaped, so the young folk can have the discipline and the stamina they need for life. They need a man in their life. They need the greatest pull that a child has is a desire to get accepted by their father. M most of my friends that are wealthy people, all of them were seeking, and even in making their wealth, to please their father. To please their father. The father's love is a great love. And so we need to put our arms as fathers around our children, as somebody said last night, and give them the certain of that love. Uh, Jacob did that to Joseph. And that's what made Joseph such a strong person. He knew he had his father's love. His father made him a coat of many colors so that they could know, he could know, and everybody could know that this is the boy that I so deeply love. It pays off. It pays off. Now y'all know the rest of the story, don't you? Y'all know the rest of the story. Y'all know that he, uh, his brothers end up selling him down into Egypt. That didn't make any difference. Because they sold him down into Egypt, they sold him to one of the governors, one of the uh, uh, pharaoh's aides, and he got in that house and he took over the house. I mean, he made that guy rich. And you know, the wife in there, she looked at him, and she could see the character in him. The ease, the way he gave orders, the way he affirmed the dignity of the people he worked with. And everybody around him loved him. He wasn't a bossy guy. And she looked at him, and she could see it. And she got, she wanted, she got jealous. And she wanted to have sex with him. And he wouldn't do it. 
And you know she streamed that she was raped. And then you know he was thrown in prison. That didn't make any difference. That didn't make any difference. They throw him in prison, and just, you would notice that, read it carefully, just in a few days, he was managing the prison. <laughs> he had the keys to the prison, and he was managing the prison, and everywhere he went, God was with him, was with him. Yeah. And then in prison, you know, y'all know the story there, y'all, it's a kindergarten story. Y'all know the story? In prison, how he had this vision, the dream. I mean, he always had a dream. But not only did he have a dream, but he could interpret dreams. <laughs> he could interpret He knew what you was dreaming. <laughs> and, and so he could interpret dream. And, you know, he interpreted his dream, and he ends up now with the Pharaoh. And when he got with the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh said, this, this man, Joseph, becomes the first prime minister. It was no such thing as a prime minister before Joseph. Joseph was, became the first prime minister of the most powerful country on earth. And so he became the prime minister. Y'all know that story, don't you? How he saved the whole society. And then when he come to his own brothers, he said, you brothers might have meant it for evil, but God was using me in order to save the world and to save the rest of you. And so a leader is a person with vision. Let me I'll close here. My time is running out. What is my teaching is going to be this morning? Go to Psalms 1, and I'm going to go through Psalms 1, and we finish this morning. We're doing, we doing well here. Psalms 1. Psalm 1, then, is to show uh, this man, uh, 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 Joseph, to show clearly what produced him and what we want to be like. This is just a snapshot vision of this man, Joseph, and that's why I want you to go to Psalm 1 here to look at that, and we'll be finished. Look what it says, and this is Joseph. Blessed is the man or the person that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here is a one who develops association and company with good people. Good people. If you want to be successful, you got to develop company with good people. You got to get good people around you. Look what it says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Now, this is what that is what you shouldn't do. This is what you need to do in order to be successful, to be God's person. Look what it says here again. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, what he's saying is, his delight is in the word of God. If we're going to be Christian community developers, we got to delight in the word of God. We got to go to the word of God every day. We need to get our orders from the word of God. And we need to read the word of God to digest it first in our own life so that we can grow. But his delight is in the word of God. And in his word does he meditate day and night. And so we need to saturate our lives with the Word of God day and night. And then we have then the results of that good leader. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Isn't that Joseph? Everywhere Joseph went, he prospered. Everywhere he went, look what it says here. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruits in his season. His leaves also shall not wither, but whatsoever he do, he shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Look. There is a way that we can be successful. I preach a lot against this naming and claim it theology, this health and wealth theology. But let me tell you this, after saying that, that God has a plan of creative prosperity. Yeah. And that plan of creative prosperity is for us to be faithful to him and to the word of God. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg bread. And if we will walk 
humbly before the Lord. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that we need will be added. God has a plan of prosperity, but it's not a good luck plan. Amen. It's not a name and claim it plan. It's a plan of being diligent, faithful, working hard, giving all you can to God's work and saving all you can to send your kids to school. God has a plan of prosperity. And that plan is to use us to be diligent in doing the work that he calls us to do. Well, my time is gone uh, this morning. Let's just take a minute and pray, and I'm going to do something else. Father, thank you for this morning. Prepare us for tomorrow morning as we look at being vulnerable. We've looked this morning at this wonderful man, Joseph, and how you shaped his life, how he was a person of vision, and now, Lord, we pray that we would listen carefully as two of our dear brothers come and share a little of their life this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, stay still. What I want to use this time for, always, is to use this time to let you look into the life of other people and look at ministries. I've got two young men that I'm just so delighted this morning that both of these are two black young men. And I want them to come. I want Jarvis Ward, who is with, come on Jarvis, Jarvis is with Mission, Miss, Mission America. He used to be with Mission Mississippi and did a wonderful job of bringing blacks and whites together throughout our state, particularly in our city of Jackson. And he served that job for about five years, and now God has called him on to something beautiful. And I can say more about him. I can say more about him. Uh, but I want him to come and just to share a little of his life and share a little with us about Mission America. Good morning. Uh, I will race on. I was reminded by my dear brother, uh, John, uh, the importance of uh, being a man of integrity. And the integrity is to uh, make sure that I stay within the uh, time refrains. And because of that, I wrote down everything that I'm going to say so that if I'm led of the spirit, it's going to be on the text right here. <laughs> we, we, we all know that no one church can reach our city. No one congregation can do it. And no one ministry nor can one denomination reach our city with the demonstration and the declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, it's clear in scripture that we are called in unity. God's heart is that the church in unity should demonstrate and declare the gospel, should show and share the gospel. It's a package deal. It's not either or, it's both and. It's a package deal that the gospel is not only declared, the gospel is demonstrated. The gospel is carried out in a partnership. Our Lord, in the very last days of his life, what is he doing? He is praying for what? He is praying so that those who will believe might be one. Not so that they would go out and declare their unity. No, so that the gospel in demonstration and in power of the Holy Spirit might go forth in cities so that people might know that the reconciler, Jesus Christ, is come. Mission America, an unprecedented, I get this now, an unprecedented coalition of national denominations, national ministries, national leaders coming together for the first time ever in the history of the church. You've got close to 300 national leaders cooperating on a national prayer and evangelism initiative called Celebrate Jesus 2000. You see, we, our time system is based on the one we all have been called to know and to love Jesus Christ, his birth. And so as this millennium is ending, the church is being mobilized by God. Now it's a mobilization of God in cities and communities to come together to pray for and to share Christ with every man, woman, and child over the next two and a half years. But it doesn't end there, folks. The partnership that's happening with urban and suburban churches and ministries, those partnerships continue on into the next millennium. So yes, yes, over the next two and a half years as this national initiative is 
catalyzing churches to come together for the first time and to partner together for the first time in their cities and communities. It doesn't end over the next two and a half years. They continue on in the city reaching partnerships to reclaim and to recapture our cities in the name and in the practice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to close with just this thought. There's a lot I could share. There's a booth, by the way, outside, uh, right across the, the hall of Celebrate Jesus 2000. You can get a lot more of the information. Dr. Perkins is one of our honorary chairpersons. We've got Dr. Billy Graham, Dr. Bill Bright. We've got a whole list of who's who, of who those people are who are a part of Celebrate Jesus 2000 and Mission America. Jesus Christ laid out very clearly to us, go and make disciples. We understand that Jesus Christ, the great reconciler, he is the only one who can reconcile men and women, young and old, to God. He has called us into the practice and in the proclamation of that gospel. He's called you and I to go and tell people, not just with our lips, but with our lives. And he is calling, he is calling his church in the latter part of this millennium why are we still around? Why are we around? Why aren't there other generations? We are here for the purpose of proclaiming and practicing the gospel of Jesus Christ and to carry it on. It is the heart of God that the church would be in unity in doing that. There are city reaching partnerships that are being catalyzed all over the country for the first time ever. What is on the heart of our Lord? It is his heart that we would go and tell the people not just with our lips, but with our lives and how we live. We are to go and tell the people that the only one who can reconcile them to God has come. And so he's saying to CCDA, in partnership with Mission America, in partnership with your ministry and all the other things, he's telling us to go and tell the people that the reconciler, Jesus Christ, has come. And that is what he is calling us to do in our cities and communities. And the question becomes, are we doing what we can do as believers to partner with the rest of the body of Christ in our city to reach the whole of the city with the whole of the gospel? Is that what's happening where you are? I believe God is calling us to do that. He's doing that. And he's using Mission America Celebrate Jesus 2000 as part of that. There's exciting days ahead of us, some very exciting days. We are called to go and tell the people what? That the reconciler is come. And, and, and we, we in CCDA want to join with that movement and to be a part of that movement. The, and, and, and his booth is out there. Get more information on that. Carry that information back to your church so we can be a part of it. Know the plan, how we want to reach every uh, person in the, in, the, in, the, in the United States with the gospel by the year 2000. It's a challenge. It's something we can do. It's, it's achievable, and we all get behind it. Now, the next person I want to introduce here gives my heart such a delight. You know, there are, there are many of my friends I have met who have uh, given their life to Christ who have had great opportunities in life. Some of them, I, I admire Gordon Murphy, who works with us. Gordon Murphy is a gifted, gifted, successful businessman who, have, who are now working and giving his time uh, to us and several other organizations. And that's what he want to do. So he's given up just making money to serve God. We have a young man here, and I'm really thankful for this, a young black man, one uh, an All-American. A young man is uh, one of these A students. Uh, went through college, went through law school, was a winner in everything he'd been involved in, making money, but then felt call of God to take his law skill. He worked, he's been a partner in the largest law firm in Sacramento, and it don't seem to me like it's nothing in Sacramento but lawyers. Uh, but he was, a, he was on the top of the heap of the lawyers in Sacramento. And he decided that he wanted to, he watched how people was able to use money and to manage money. And that he wanted to be able to manage that money for the kingdom of God 
and to do something for the kingdom of God. And I want you folks to hear him. He heads an organization that's called uh, uh, the Near My Housing Development Corporation. And he'll tell you about it. It's a wonderful one. Don, will you come here quickly and speak to, speak to our people here? And we got to be timely. You got three good minutes. <laughs> shall be of thee shall build the old waste places thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of paths to dwell in I have been blessed to be called to be in the business of providing resources to God's people to do ministry and that is a joy like Joseph the Lord gave me a youthful vision of how we can be involved in community restoration like Joseph I had a loving father in fact Dr. Mitchell right there, who was my mentor, my guide, and who always said to me as I would achieve one level of success to the next, Don, you are a Joseph who has found favor with Pharaoh. At every step along the way, whether it was the law firm, whether it was becoming a Truman Scholar, whether it was blessing upon blessing, my father, Dr. Mitchell, was always grabbing me by the shoulder and shaking his finger and reminding me, you are a Pharaoh, a Joseph who has found favor with Pharaoh. Like Paul, I am a former legal scholar, still am a legal scholar, who has fallen on my donkey. <laughs> and has been redirected by God for a vision of community restoration. Like Elijah, I feel a passion and a sense of prophetic call that we can't just sit by the brook. That God is calling us to community restoration. Nehemiah Housing is a national nonprofit organization that in the last two years has provided over $20 million to over 5,000 families to become homeowners across America. And we've done that without any government funding whatsoever. Nehemiah is an organization that has founded a ministry called Nehemiah Urban Ministries whose mission is to plant urban missionaries in communities that are being targeted for community re re restoration. In fact, I'm pleased to say that our first urban missionary is a young man who came to me from Dr. Perkins named Thad Culpepper who was one of the original Harambe kids from the Harambe school in Pasadena. We're convening a discussion group this afternoon at 4.30. I don't know the exact location yet it will be on the, on, the, on the message board. I'm here at this conference because there are those of you who have a passion in ministry that's focused on inner city housing restoration and home ownership. We want to partner with you with our program to increase the number of people that are Christian people living in the inner city who have begun the process of stewardship through home ownership. I look forward to seeing you at our discussion group at 4.30. Again, we'll post the location. May God bless you, and I hope to talk with you during the conference. Not, not only are these young men uh, good at what they're doing, but they're also timely. Isn't that wonderful? They are timely in doing that. Now I'm going to give my time over. Uh, I'm going to give my time over. But before I give my time over, you know, I'm always... People, when I go across the country and speak to people, most of the people that I find who are involved in Christian work, they will come to me and they'll say to me, John, I read one of your books. John, I got hold of one of your books. So I'm not just here peddling these books just to be peddling them, although I am peddling them. I like peddling them. Okay, that's so. But I'm here because these are the resources that you can take back to your community and that you can pass them on to others. What we've done here is that we put together packages of books. This book here costs $18 in the bookstore. This book here costs $12 in the bookstore and on this one here they cost ten dollars each in the bookstore and this one costs five in the bookstore we are putting them together out there 
and you can get all of these for $35. We're putting them together in packages. And you can also exchange any of these for any of the other books we have, but we want you to carry this one for certain because this is the children version of our Christian community development. We want to pass on what we are learning to the next generation. So go out there, the booth is right outside the door. I'll be out there, I will sign one of them. I will not sign all five of these books. But I will sign one for you out there. Now you're in the hands of the moderator. Who's the moderator? Right. Let's uh, get some sound on number.